Hey guys, it's Max, and we're back with Battle Code 2016. In this exciting episode, I'm going to show you some of the work that I've done visualizing pathing algorithms. If you've seen Battle Code in previous years, this is going to look a lot like that. So we're going to start out with a program that makes a maze. It starts by making these branching random walk paths until the whole area is filled. Then we're going to look at different algorithms for getting from one corner of the maze to the other. We're trying to get from the bottom left corner up to the top right. Now this is called depth first search and it starts by looking at the farthest possible depth. You can see that it's found the solution now. The idea is that it's extending, let's slow it down a little bit, it's extending the path one increment at a time and it'll only finish this branch of the path when it hits a dead end. So it's not even looking here. This could be the solution right here in this corner, but it wouldn't find it, at least not until later, because first it's got to go until it sees the very end of this path. And then only once it's failed that does it start over from the most recent place where it could have made a decision. At least that's the way it's working the way I've implemented it. Okay, so that's breadth first search here. And you can read more about these things online, but I just thought I would provide these videos showing how it works. So I'm going to abort that and I'm going to show a breadth first search example. All right. So it's trying many branches and then it stops the moment that it finds the solution. Let's slow it down a little bit. So you can see that it's extending all these branches in parallel. It's like a broad search of the available solution space. One advantage of breadth first search is that if your map is made of Euclidean distances, you're likely to find the closest location immediately. And you won't have to rewrite it or look at the same location from several directions. To illustrate this more clearly, let's look at a larger map, one that's more open. So let's take this one, for example, or maybe this one, where there are only two small obstacles. OK, let's try the depth first search. So. We're going along the side of this obstacle, and now we're just heading in, this, in the direction of the target. The goal is about one tile away from the corner, but the breadth first search is going to actually pass the goal and start heading in a crazy direction. Okay, now it hits the goal, but there might be a faster way to get there. So it's avoiding that and trying the next path and there are a lot of paths to try in this way. So let's set the delay as small as possible and then see the result. Oh man, you can see that it's searching some pretty crazy looking paths. It's gonna take a really long time for it to decide on the right path. So let's go ahead and pause it right there. You can see that it's searching all these little variations on the same bad path. Sometimes it can be hard to abort the evaluation. Let's try a breadth first version of that. So we can see it's searching these parallel paths, which is much more effective at traversing a very open space. And now it's found the solution. Lastly, let's look at uh, bug navigation. In this case, 
you go until you see a wall and then you follow the wall until you get past it. So this is an example where the yellow dot shows the location of the guy's hand. He's got his hand out, he's holding his hand on the right wall and he's just following it around until the end. I'll show it again. So he hits the wall here on his way to the target and here he exits the wall because he knows, he knows he's gotten past it. He can sense the distance to the target has decreased and he doesn't have the wall in front of him anymore. So that's why he leaves the wall, but here he hits it again. Hits the wall again as, on his path straight to the target and he puts his right hand out and holds that hand on the wall and ends up going all the way around and only exits the wall here. We can actually post-process this path for example, let's say that this guy knew ahead of time what the map looked like. Bug is good because you only need to know the tiles in front of you. But let's say he knew the whole map ahead of time. Well then, he doesn't have to take this whole extra loop. Having seen that he will do this route, he can decide to skip the loop. We can do that prog programmatically by having any turns appear early. So here, here again is an image of the same route or a piece of it where green is the tile that I'm checking if I can go to and red is a circle indicating where I'm located. So I'm about to make a left turn so I can just check and see if I can make that left turn sooner. Similarly when I'm when I'm here I can check and see if I can make a right turn sooner because that blue dot indicates a right turn. So similarly going all along I can try to make these turns sooner and in any place where I double back on my own location I can just delete those two moves. So let's try rerouting the path. So this is the path originally, and then we'll try to make those turns earlier, like here. We'll try to turn before we get to there. And sure enough, we turn sooner, and so we're not getting so close to this, this boundary here. Same thing here, before we, we, all, we went all the way to the edge, but now we don't. And each time we reroute the path, we remove some excess motion until the point where these loops are closing. And when the loops close, they become lines, and then it becomes obvious that you don't want to go down and back along the same route. So then you delete those excess elements, um, and those elements then become shorter, and the path becomes shorter. So each time I run this, the path is truncating, until at some point, we arrive at pretty much the same path that you would get doing breadth first search. Pretty interesting. Okay, one last thing I wanted to show is in this pathing test document that I've got here. What I'm going to show is that using breadth first search, you can actually path from every location to a given location. So let's do an example here. In this case, we're at gettowork.xml, that map that we made together. And we're trying to path to this point, which is, say, I don't know, a headquarters or, a, or an archon that we really want to get to. So what we do is, starting from this point, is we check all the adjacent tiles and if they're empty then we fill them with an arrow pointing in the direction that we came from. So from here all the arrows are pointing out because this arrow has already executed and we go around and around and for each new row we make a new arrow saying which way am I going. And this ar these arrows gradually fill pointing outward and over here it's had to turn around so as the fill is in this direction, the arrows are in that direction, and I've colored them uh, as well to make it a little easier to see. Eventually, the whole map is going to get filled with these directional arrows, and you might say, well, what's the point here? I mean, yeah, I can get to anywhere from this point, but I only really have one destination. Aha! But suppose you had many origins and only one destination. Say that you wanted your units around the entire map to get to this location. How would you do it? Well, check it out. You can just reverse all of these arrows. And I've got a little thing that'll do that. So we'll do that and then you'll see that all the arrows lead back to home. So if I push direction minus one like this, all the arrows have reversed direction. So now imagine I'm, I don't know, up here. I just follow the arrows. Go down, go diagonally, go down, go right, go down, down, diagonally left, left, diagonal, and then there. So this is a map that gets me directly to this point. And it's fairly easy to compute this, and it's only once. 
So this is an example of one way that you can do a computation on a map and then make it easier for your robots subsequently to get to that location. All right, that's all I've got for now. Till next time, see ya.